It's that time of the day. Yes, it really is. It's time for Talking Pints and I'm joined in the studio tonight by Lord David Frost. Welcome to the programme. Great to be here. Cheers. Thanks for having me. You're a, an East Midlands lad, but a bit conflicted between Derby and Nottingham. How does that work? Uh, yeah, you're right. I went to school in Nottingham, but I'm really from Derby and Derby County, who have not had a great season, as can be said, <laughs> for reasons beyond their control. Uh, that's, that's, where, that's where I still feel I belong. Yeah, and of course, I mean, your career, you know, it's classic stuff, isn't it? It's Oxford, it's the Foreign Office, you know, you are one of these pillars of the Remain establishment, I suppose, at least by background and by inclination. Now, you worked in Brussels and you worked in New York and all over the world. I know from my time in the European Parliament, you know, whenever I met Foreign Office officials, whether it was formally or perhaps informally, I mean, they were the biggest enthusiasts for the European project. <laughs> I mean, they weren't neutral civil servants. They were, they, they, they were actively part of building hmm. this new European structure. I mean, I'm assuming when you went in there, that's how you felt as well. Yeah, I mean, I went in, when was it, early 90s, and uh, I hadn't thought you know, massively much about it at that point. I guess I had, as you say, standard foreign office opinions on and it was a, And it was a settled political issue, wasn't it? It our, was. Our pretty membership. We were, we, it membership certainly was. Yeah. We were just yeah. getting into the, the Maastricht row uh, and all of that at that point. Um, but the longer I spent in Brussels, the, the more I thought, this is not for us. This is uh, an organisation that is going somewhere that this country doesn't want to go. Uh, the processes, the way it works, are not right. They're overriding national democracies. And the longer I spent there, the, um, uh, the more I felt that. So. Could you tell any of your work colleagues? Or was, <laughs> it, was this a guilty secret? So I think uh, I, I, a few, I think, came to suspect what I thought, <laughs> especially during the, suspect, uh, like the, 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 the constitutional treaty referendums in, in 2005. I, I think, you know, there were a few kind of closet sympathisers as well, who obviously I'm not going to, to name, but, but not everybody was oh, identical, <laughs> central casting. But, um, yeah, you're right, overwhelmingly. But, but the Foreign Office is not particularly unusual in that, obviously, in the British establishment. I was going to say, couldn't we look at every Whitehall department and find much that same thinking? And even today, you know, all these years on from the referendum, there's still, I sense within the British civil service, a deep sense of regret about what we've done. I think, I think it's still there. It's definitely be weakened, I would say, since, since 2016. People have got used to the idea. I think what people are finding hard now in government, in the civil service, is suddenly being in charge. When we're in the EU, you didn't have to think. Because they, made, just, they yes, made the decisions exactly, and they told exactly. us what to do. Now, all of a sudden, our destiny is in our own hands and uh, we're hesitating a little bit. And that's, that's probably underlying some of the problems we've got at the moment. I suspect that's probably true. Now, it's unusual for somebody who's been in the Foreign Office, and albeit you were thrown into the spotlight, obviously, with this... Mm. Well, firstly, working with Boris, but then, you know, with this, with this Brexit role. How did you find Michel Barnier? <laughs> I, I liked Michel, actually. I mean, he was a different generation, different style to me. He was a very nice person, actually, very uh, pleasant, easy to deal with. I'm not sure he ever regarded me as, as some quite an equal. Uh, to oh, him, he's very but, superior, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, <laughs> a very nice, a very nice guy. And actually, you know, in a, in an odd sort of way, we we hit it off okay during the talks and managed to get things done. He didn't really understand it at all, did he? He, I mean, I remember having conversations with him formally in his office and in the coffee room. And he couldn't get his head around the fact that we voted Brexit. He didn't understand it for a moment. But when you came into that job, you know, we were in a right pickle, weren't we? Yeah. Well, I mean, we really were. We'd had predecessors, Ollie Robbins, etc. Um, and we finished up with Mrs May, you know, in a terrible place, it seemed to me. Um, and thank goodness that deal went and we got something. Well, I guess it was a bit better, but it's not really a great deal, is it? So, I, I, I mean, you said it. We wouldn't have started from here no. uh, to, to, to get to it. We had to deal with no, I, the consequences. I, I do acknowledge, yeah. I do acknowledge yeah. that you inherited a very bad hand of cards. Mm. And I get that, and I understand that, and this couldn't go on forever. And I understand that. But I have to ask you, mm. you know, Northern Ireland, you know, I mean, because... 
Boris Johnson just didn't tell people the truth about this, did he? So we'd like to have done better. We'd like, well, obviously, well, that's we would have say, liked, we'd like to have, we would like <laughs> to have had uh, customs arrangements that avoided some of the problems we've, we've got into subsequently. Obviously would. We would. Unfor unfortunately, we had um, Messrs. Ben and Burt and the Surrender Acts and the removal of the, the No Deal option. Uh, in that time, and in the end, and that weakened your hand. That massively weakened the hand. You could see it. You could see it immediately. They knew that although we we tried to, with a little bit of smoke and mirrors, suggest there might still be an option. They knew there wasn't. We knew there wasn't. In the end, we had to do the best we could, and we at least got rid of the backstop. If we hadn't done that, we would mm. still be negotiating to leave the EU customs union now. And we gave ourselves freedom for the future and the future negotiations that we, we delivered on, I think. All right. So what do we do in Northern Ireland now? So We've got to do something. We do. I think you know, it was a deal that could have worked with delicate handling on both sides, sensitivity to the need for cross-community consent in Northern Ireland. That was always going to require a degree of sensitivity on the EU side that, they, that, that been in, hasn't but, been there. But they've been in bed with Sinn Féin all the way through this process. I think the, much of the EU doesn't understand the niceties and the details and the history of the issues in, in Northern Ireland. And in the end, I think they prioritise protecting their own single market over the Belfast Good Friday mm. Agreement. And mm. that, that is the problem. I think you know, whatever the rights and wrongs of how we got here, um, the protocol has to change or disappear. I think there's now no option. Much better to do it by negotiation if the EU will do it. Though but, if we but, read in the paper, they've just said that they never will change their negotiating mandate and negotiate with us about it. So well, I Macron, think we're left with no I mean, other Macron, choice. Macron not only has he just you know, won the French presidency again, hmm. but he's also got the rotating presidency of the European Union. Merkel's gone. He's the dominant figure within the yeah. place. I mean, they're not going to give us an inch, are they? I, I think it's very unlikely now that they're going to engage in a natural negotiation. So we're going to have to act, I think. I don't think there's any choice left to us, whether it's this famous Article 16 or an override. I think there's no other option to protect the Belfast Good Friday Agreement and the integrity of the, the country. I think you know, the, the government is responsible for the governance of Northern Ireland, and in the end, got to accept that. Do, does this government have the courage to do it? So I think yes. I think yes. I hope yes. Um, it will, there'll, there'll obviously be opposition, I guess some opposition in the Commons, probably a bit more in the Lords to, to legislation. I think they'll be able to take on the, the international opposition if there is much. Mm. And uh, obviously the dynamics internationally have changed hugely since uh, last year. I, I think it can be done and I think it has to be done. And if we explain it right, then there's no reason why we shouldn't. Yeah, I mean, at the moment, we're literally a part of our country has been cut off from us, effectively. Yeah. A border down the Irish Sea. Border down the Irish Sea, and rules for that part of this country set somewhere else. Mm. And yeah. uh, uh, you, th there's no way you can sustain that over an extended no. period. You just can't. Now, the front page of today's Times, big optimistic headline about the Queen's speech tomorrow, which sadly the Queen won't be yeah. there for, which is very sad. It is. Um, very sad. But big optimistic headlines that we're going to hear mass reform of EU rules and regulations and all the things that I dreamt of for over a quarter of a century, having come into politics from business. Why hasn't any of this been done before? So I suppose we had COVID. That, that no, was I a reasonable that. distraction, I, yeah, I, I think, for a, for a bit of time. I, I do think that, you know, we, we, we haven't... Um, pushed on as quickly as we, we ought to have. That's, that's is, that, is that true. a lack of vision? Is it a lack of will? What, why? I think leaving the EU for, for many was such an effort that we've kind of, uh, particularly with COVID coming straight after, there's been mm. a temptation just to kind of say, thank goodness that's done, and sort of sit back in the armchair. And, is that because and the Conservative on. Party doesn't really believe in Brexit still? I think, I think it does. I believe it does. Mm. Um, but I don't know whether everybody has yet clocked that there's going to have to be a massive change afterwards. Brexit's just a, a door you've got to go through to make lots of things possible. 
in terms of changing this country. It, it isn't a thing in itself, and I think too many no, people thought it was a, yeah. a thing in itself. Yeah, yeah no, no, no. no. I, I, you know, I was always honest about this. Brexit doesn't solve our problems, no. but it gives us the ability to deal with things. What I find really interesting, you know, since your resignation from the Cabinet, and where you talked about us, us having to learn to live with COVID, but you've written quite extensively since then. Mm. I mean, gosh, you must be very lonely. I was thinking to myself this morning, I mean, you believe in small state, you believe in low taxes, you believe in encouraging entrepreneurship, you believe optimistically that we can turn ourselves around and have a, a sort of Brexit Britain renaissance. I mean, I have to put it to you, you sound like a conservative. <laughs> Must be very difficult in this party today, mustn't it? I mean, they're all so, but they're all social democrats, aren't they? I, no, I think there's been a, a kind of climate of opinion that's pulled people along in, in recent years. I think most of the party still, in its heart, believes in low taxes and obviously believes in this country and wants to make it great, deliver on the the promise of Brexit. But we that does require some difficult decisions, and I don't think. You know, we the government's got to be honest with people and say some of this is going to be difficult, some of it's going to be hard, but it's going to be worth it because we're going to make the country better. And if you don't say that, you inevitably drift along in the flow and you become social democratic. And at some point, you've got to draw a line. But I mean, we've become that if you look at climate policy, if you look at the fact we import 50% of our gas, we export manufacturing jobs, whether it's in chemicals or aluminium production or whatever it is. I mean, they've gone very social democrat, haven't they? So the priority for the government of this country ought to be increasing the productive capacity of this, this country and the wealth of people in this country. If we can pursue net zero and do those things, then OK. But the priority ought to be boosting industry, boosting um, productivity, making our own supplies of, of energy effective. That should be the first So you would, you would, would you, I mean, I've been pushing hard and arguing that we should be self-sufficient in well, energy. We should get as, as close as we can. I, I mean, it may not ever be possible or, or possible in the, the near future, but obviously we should be taking up fracking again. Obviously we should be investing in the, the North Sea. Obviously we should be doing nuclear. But... It, it's no good giving half-hearted signals. Companies are not going to invest in the North Sea if they think the government might change its mind again in a year's time. Similarly on fracking. You've yeah. got to believe it. Or introduce it. super taxes or, 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 any, or any, any, any of these things. things. Yeah. It, a lot of it is about clear signals. Then, you know, clear signals on taxation, clear signals on energy policy, so people can know what's coming and change their own behaviour accordingly. Are you the sort of modern-day Keith Joseph? <laughs> I mean, are you the man trying to get the Conservative Party to move from where it is into being low tax? And, 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 and if you are, if you are, well, that's great, because someone needs to make those arguments out there. And you are beginning to make those arguments more loudly. But I'm struck that to really have an effect on these things, the House of Lords is a bit of a backwater. And you could just, why not just renounce the title and put your name forward for the by-election in Devon? So I don't think the Lords is a particularly brilliant place to do kind of real <laughs> politics yeah. from. Um, uh, I think, you know, you, you need to be in the Commons to do real politics. That's, that's, that's obvious. I mean, I've only just left government, obviously. Um, I'm contributing by ideas and by writing. Yeah. But, but, yeah, I'll be honest. Uh, I, I don't think it's right this time round for all kinds of reasons. But if in the future the opportunity comes up and the party wants me to do it, then obviously I would uh, be ready to uh, stand down from the seat and do proper politics again. He's about 50 to 1 at Labrooks at the moment, but which is a big surprise. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, but I mean, inevitably, if you if you were to finish up in politics in that way, the, the fact you are setting out a clear, and some can agree and some can disagree violently with it, but you're setting out a clear intellectual vision for the Conservative Party. I mean, I, I teased you earlier about about Keith Joseph, but I mean, yours is a broadly Thatcherite view of where we need to go. 
Yeah, I think it is, except that we have to remember that Thatcher was not only about free markets. Thatcher was about the country. She was about standing up for aspiration and people who wanted to get on in life and mm. improve themselves and help their families and make the country better. And you have to do all of those things. It isn't just about free markets and devil take the hindmost. It's about bringing everyone together. And I, I think actually Boris Johnson is capable of doing that and would be, would be good at it. We just need to push on and uh, make it a reality. Do you think he'll lead the Tories in, into the next general election? I do, actually, yeah. Well, we will see. Grammar schools. Where do you stand on grammar schools? Bit of a <laughs> bit of a debate opened up last week on that again. Yeah, I, I think... I mean, I, I'm in favour of academic excellence. I think excellence in everything is, is important if we're going to succeed as a country. I think the problem with the old grammar school system was that it was a once and for all sift. And if you just didn't happen to make it at 11, you were irrevocably kind of left in the secondary modern route. And that, that obviously doesn't make sense. But we need a system. We need an educational system that supports the brightest to do the very best they can mm. and supports people who want to do other things to do the very best they can and we've never quite got that parity of esteem in this country but we no, should. No, and we lack esteem also for trades and skills. Yes. I, I, I'm just astonished by it. You know, um, Tony Blair two weeks ago advocating 70% go to university yes. and do more and more social sciences or whatever it is and yet I speak to people in engineering, they have to bring in foreign labour. Yeah. I mean, all of that stuff is absolutely crazy, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. You've got to let the market work. I think, you know, if, 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 um, if, if, if the expectation is people go to university and do a, a, a pointlessly relevant degree, then they won't be able to get a job. And in the end, the incentives will, will work. And, you know, we're seeing people going into trades because they don't build up debt and uh, they can do a great job. So that's good. Well, I have to say, I'm going to watch your progress very, very carefully. I really am. <laughs> Thank you for joining me on Thank Talking Minds. It's a pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you.